Well, hello, how are you all today, and welcome to Stone Knot Church. Although this is a message for the church, uh, I'm going to put this on the Integrative Preparedness channel as well, because I think some people will be interested in this, and because it was the result of a question that I received from M.I. Prepper, uh, who is a, a member of the Integrative Preparedness Patreon channel. And MI, which I believe stood, stands for Military Intelligence, I think that's his background. I've enjoyed uh, reading a number of his comments. Obviously, a, 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 an intelligent person who knows what he's talking about has good questions and good comments. But he asked the, the, the question, uh, how I became a Christian, or, or why I'm a Christian. Uh, I don't remember which of those. Uh, they're slightly different, but, but they, they approach the, the subject, you know, fairly well equally. But that, he says he, he would find that interesting and thought other people might also. So I thought, you know, that is uh, sometimes you get a question that really becomes a calling and you realize that you should do something. And I haven't done this before <clears throat> because I never wanted it to be about me. But our, our own stories and our own testimonials, uh, are important, and they can they can they can help people. And for us to keep those to ourselves is uh, is is I think uh, false humility, humility and 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 counter to what the Lord would have us do. So I will I'll tell my story here. Uh, it's a complex story. I will say that I'll try to keep it within the parameters of understanding, and I will ask you, or I'll tell you, feel free to share this with whomever you want. Now, I, I, have, uh, I have stopped allowing comments on the, um, the YouTube channel simply because there's, there's just too much hate on there and, and too much argumentativeness and, and too much. And when I, when I want to give a message, it's for me to give the message, and it's not that I don't welcome conversation later but that's what our patreon channels are for and whether it's on the integrative preparedness patreon channel whether it's on the stonemont church patreon channel a lot of people don't realize that the church channel has a patreon uh, channel i haven't checked it that much in the past and if anybody asked a question and i didn't get back to them i apologize i will start doing that daily from now on because i'm going to be doing something different with that patreon channel and we'll be putting more stuff up there and I also haven't been doing a lot on the regular YouTube at Stonemont Church channel, but I think this has kind of been, MI has kind of given me a call that, that maybe I should do this. Excuse me just a second. I had to clear my throat. I'll try not to do that too often during this time. Um, so anyway, for any questions that you would have, that you would like to, or, or whatever, um, I will check the Patreon channels. So my story is is complex, but it starts out simple. Okay, I was, uh, uh, and maybe I should preface this by saying I, I did not have a moment, I did not have a road to Damascus moment because I was raised in a Christian home. I got away from it later on that I'll tell you about. But I was raised in a Christian home, <clears throat> went to church every, <clears throat> you know, was, was christened, my family was big in the church, uh, great supporters of the church often had the the preacher over for Sunday dinner, and, and it was a big church too. Uh, my grandparents were very central to to that church, so I was raised within it. Uh, I, there's a picture of me. I think I was three years old with a little shovel. Me and another little kid uh, breaking ground for a new church. Uh, my family was was central, instrumental in the building of the new church. So I was raised within this. Uh, church, Sunday school every Sunday, prayers, a family, a Christian family, and a family that didn't just talk it, but modeled the elements of, of Christianity. Uh, when I was, I'm not sure, 12 maybe, I became a junior deacon in the church that I attended at that time. So I was, I was all, all about it. <clears throat> when I was 13 years old, 
Billy Graham brought his his crusade to Kansas City. This was in 1967. I had to look it up because I wasn't sure. Uh, Kansas City and spoke, uh, you know, one of his crusades. You're familiar with them at Municipal Stadium. No longer there, but it's where the Kansas City A's and, and the Chiefs played their first several seasons there, actually. Uh, and so he came and we all went down there. And when he made his call, uh, you know, for everybody to come forward and, and accept Jesus, I did. And at that time, and I don't remember a lot of details of it, I'll be honest. Uh, but I know that I did it and I accepted Jesus, even though Jesus had always been a part of my life. It was just a part of the fabric of, of our lives. There was never a question in my life that there was a God, that Jesus was born uh, of, of a virgin, that he was the Son of God, that he was God, although I, you know, my young mind couldn't, couldn't put that together. I didn't quite understand, but I accepted it. And, uh, and that he, as a result of, of his sacrifice, saved us from our sins. Now, you can imagine at that time, um, you know, the sins of a 13-year-old were, well, you know, you can have. But anyway. Uh, I continued through my life uh, doing the things, you know, not being overly involved in church. Still went on church. I went went to church because there were cute girls there, you know. But my family was was still surrounding me in the Christian concepts. And as I as I grew older, I pretty much stayed the same. When I went into law enforcement at 21, and, and I will say that my teen years, I, I got a little wild. Okay, and no reason to go into that. I, I never did anything horrible, but I got a little wild, you know. I was not necessarily the 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 straight arrow that you know parents want their boys to be, or that many many guys were. So you know, I, I was I was coloring outside the lines a little bit. Nothing serious, but definitely outside the lines. My parents didn't know about most of it, like most most kids, you know. And to the extent that uh, that they did, of course, they tried to get me back within the lines. Uh, but every time I did something that I I knew I shouldn't have, I felt guilty. Okay. I went into law enforcement when I was 21, and that's when I got my first real look at the horrors of this world. And they were a bit difficult for me to understand and deal with. Uh, there was a lot of there was it was exciting certainly it, it appealed to my sense of you know like most young men have to go out and do something exciting and dangerous and all that so appeal to that. But I, I started seeing the horrible things that that people did to other people, and. Uh, and it was in a, a large city, so I, I got to see a lot of it. I did several years in uh, on, on the street in uniform, and then after a number of years, I went undercover narcotics. And when I went undercover narcotics, and then after that, and to other things, I started seeing the real, the real monster. You know, there, there is a saying, and I, I should have looked this up. It would have made a much better message if I had looked it up. Um, but it's one of those that when you stare into the abyss, the abyss also stares into you. And I stared into the abyss, and I felt the abyss entering me. Uh, I think it was Nietzsche that, that said also something about, you know, if you, if you fight the monsters, be careful that you don't become a monster, something to that effect. Again, I apologize for not looking it up. It would have sounded a lot better if I had just been able to spill this out, but I didn't really prepare this message. I just wanted to sit down and talk about it and answer this question. Well, I did fight the monsters, and I became the monster. I became a monster. I, I got to the point to where um, human life meant very little to me. Uh, including my own, to be honest. Uh, it was, I, I had gone to the depths 
to fight the monster, but then I stayed in the depths. And I did very well in the depths. I thought. And I thought that I was living life my way. Now along those years, as I, as I went through my decline, um, I would have thoughts of my behavior and how God would see those. But I pushed those thoughts away because I knew that I couldn't do what I wanted to do. And still, obey God, or even think about God. And so, because of my carnal nature, my sinful nature, which all of us share, I made the decision to stop thinking about God and pursue the way that I wanted to go. Well, we know there is a way that seems right to a man, but leads to death, right? And that's not just talking about physical death. That's talking about spiritual death. And so I went on a long journey of spiritual suicide. And I don't mean that I meant to. I was not suicidal. I don't mean any of that. But I was killing my spirit daily by continuing to pursue the things that I wanted in this world and pushing God away. I, I got to the point that... I stopped thinking about God altogether. He was not a part of my life. And I thought that I was having a great life. And if anybody looked at my life from the outside, it looked like I had everything. All the things. The money, the... I don't want to speak too carnally here, but the women, the... Uh, Gambling. I ran. I ran gambling games. I, I. I was. I was in it. In the life, in the street life, in the underworld life, up to my neck. I thought I was doing well. One night, and I told. I told Kelly this story the other day. I never told her this before. I never told anybody this before. But I was telling her how I was thinking about making this video in response to M.I.'s question. And uh, let me back up. I need to reinsert something else. For a while, I became very interested in the paranormal. Probably a lot of this stemmed from working midnight shifts uh, in uniform and listening to, uh, what was it, Art Bell and things, you know, and everything about the paranormal and and uh, demonology and and uh, ghosts and things like that. I became I, I I started to study the paranormal a lot. I got very deep into it. Stories that I'll probably never share because I don't want to. I don't even want to think about that anymore. And I don't talk about it anymore. Sometimes and I, I tell you, I was so deep. I have been I have been. Um, quoted in magazine articles. I've been covered in newspaper articles and, and magazine articles as as to some of my exploits in that. I'm not going to tell you what, uh, nor the name by which I was identified, uh, because I don't talk about it anymore. <clears throat> Sometimes people will try to ask me, and I'll tell them I don't talk about that. You, if you open a door, you open the wrong door, it is tough you can't close that door. I'll tell you how to how who closes it in a minute. And you know, it's, it's the Lord Himself. You open that door, and that door is open. But you are opening a door to you. That is a door that has been shut by the grace of God, and it will not reopen. So this is leading back now to a, the story that I told Kelly just the other day. And as I woke up in the middle of the night one time to the greatest sense of dread I have ever experienced. It was both subhuman and parahuman. I was laying there, and I, I was a big, tough guy. I was scared of nothing. Well, I was scared of this. The feeling was there. The terror was beyond 
my ability to describe. And I knew, I could feel the presence of evil in my room, in my bedroom, and I knew exactly where it was in the room. And just like a little kid, I held myself under my covers. I, I wouldn't look. I laid there in terror. Something in the back of my mind reminded me of a God that I had forgotten, that I had pushed away. And I tried to pray. I had forgotten how to pray. I tried, I knew that there was something. I tried to remember the Lord's Prayer. I couldn't remember the Lord's Prayer. I tried, then I laid there. And the most frightening thing about this was that this evil, I had the definite feeling that it was approving of me. And that was the most terrifying thing at all. It wasn't a threatening me. It was approving of me. I don't know how long I laid there. I don't remember if I ever got back to sleep or not. But I know the next day it had an effect on me. Fairly soon, and I, I have no memory of whether it was that night or soon thereafter, and it doesn't matter. I came to the conclusion, and a great weight came upon me. I'll put it that way. A great weight came upon me. And it was a combination of a weight and a, a, an emptiness. And I went to my knees, and I, I prayed this simple prayer. A God, a God that I could barely remember. I said, Lord, either kill me or cure me, because this living life like this is not worth living. And remember, from the outside, everybody that knew me thought I had everything. Everything that this world holds up as cool, as important, I had it all. But I knew how empty it was. And I, I, I stayed on my knees for a, quite a while. Nothing, no flash happened. No, nothing like that. But just eventually, the sense of heaviness and emptiness and dread just slowly dissolved a bit. I wasn't filled with joy. I wasn't filled with a new life. I wasn't, it just, it started to dissipate. I got up. I remember I wasn't really disappointed because I wasn't sure what to expect. I wasn't expecting too much. Uh, I got up, but just no longer wanted to. How to explain this? I no longer had the desire to continue along the life I had been living. But I didn't know what else there was. I didn't know where anything was going to lead me. And so I got up and I went around about, about my, my day. Little by little, every day, brought a slightly higher degree of comfort and feeling of peace. I stopped being attracted to the things I had been attracted to before. I wanted nothing more to do with that life. And I started feeling a peace and a drawing to a peace. Does that make sense? I, I hope this is making some sense. Over a period of years, I, I know that this would seem a lot more dramatic if I said, all of a sudden, I was reborn. Well, you see, I, I attribute this to the fact that Christ had already saved me. I had gone off. 
he had never left me, although I was left, left to the consequences of my sinful decisions and was paying for them as, as we go along. It's not that my, my sins weren't forgiven, but there are consequences when we do what we know to be wrong. And now I was starting to remember that what I had done was wrong. I started taking my life in a different direction. I got away from all the things that I had been doing. I started building a, 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 a small business and I won't go through all of the, I, I won't say that it was 100% success from there on up. I won't say that it was easy, it wasn't. But I spent years reacquainting myself with God and his word and his will. And I had many other challenges after that. Many. But I knew that now he was with me. And so all of those challenges uh, became a challenge that he was helping me with and guiding me through as opposed to me fighting through. And, you know, I, I say that, uh, you know, there's an old saying that, you know, wh whatever stands between you and God, get ready to lose it. Because God wants you. He wants you. He loves you. He wants you. And there's a, there's a saying that he will trim off the things that he doesn't want on you as pruning. And I tell people, he had to trim me with a chainsaw for years and he did and I'm far from perfect now far from it I get irritable I get angry when I shouldn't I get to thinking about my way sometimes when I shouldn't instead about his way but since he is always with me now he's able to bring me back gently sometimes not so gently but usually because he's brought me back and I wanted to stay with him. The peace, the feeling of complete love, of complete acceptance, the com feeling of complete peace that comes with your realization that God loves you completely. Once his best for you, which is much different than what you think your best it for you is. And it's much greater. It is truly the peace that surpasses all understanding. And then he gave me opportunities to reach out and express this to others. And that's been my, excuse me for just a minute. I shouldn't interrupt this at this time, but I don't want to run short. My phone will only hold about 30 seconds or 30 minutes. I'm sorry. Okay. we got a couple minutes. So he gave me, he has given me since then many opportunities to, whether it's the writing of my books, um, the church, um, dealing with other people in different, different areas. He, he's given me the blessing of being able to express these things to others. And that's why I'm doing this video here. I, di I didn't really want to because it, it felt uncomfortable to me to make it about me. But then I realized this isn't, a, and even more so, as I was talking here, I realized this isn't about me. This is about him. This is about God. This is about the love of the Father, the love of the Son, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And... As a result, I, as I told people who used to know me in the old days, I now have a life I don't deserve. None of us deserve the wonderful lives the Lord has given us, but I certainly don't. I tell people, and I talked to the wife of a, of a friend of mine who, who was somewhat like mine, and we had a life kind of like mine, and I told her, 
you don't realize. Oh, and she would say, some of the things that Jim has told me about you, I just can't believe. I, I won't identify who Jim was. But I, I named the main character of my books after him. She says, some, some of the things that Jim has told me about you, I can't believe because I see you now. And I said, I was one of the worst people you could imagine. Seriously, you think about one of the worst people you've ever known. That was either me or I was beyond that. And it's not me who got better, it's God who changed me. God loves you so much. Well, what does is, what is John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world, and that means you individually as well as the world as a whole, everyone, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And when I realized that he loved me, regardless, in spite, not because of what I've done, not because I will, you know, try to be good. No, none of us can be that good. He loved me that much in spite of the things that I've done, the things that I've thought, it's, it's beyond the ability of our human minds to understand. And it's only through the Holy Spirit indwelling us that our spirit can begin to accept it. So I simply want to say this. That's my story. For any of you who are struggling with that, you have never done anything that would drive the love of God away from you. There is only one, and I did a message on this, only one unforgivable sin. And I'll say here, I, I have heard messages on YouTube by other people who misrepresent this. The only unforgivable sin is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. No other sin is unforgivable. I don't have time to cover what that is, but you can look it up. Or I think I did a, a message on it on the church channel. Uh, but you have never done anything that has caused God to love you less. And how much does he love you? He sacrificed his only son for you. So that you could have eternal life forgiven in your sins as a result of the of the, the, the shed and sacrificial blood of his son, Jesus Christ, and bring you to him, pure, not because of what you've done or haven't done, but because of, but because of what he did for you. If you've had trouble with these things, pray. You are not beyond his reach. You are not beyond his love. He wants you. The prodigal son, read the, the, the parable of the prodigal son. You've strayed, you come back, he rejoices. He loves you, he never wants to let you go. He never will let you go. Whatever suffering you will bring, be, bring to yourself, he will ease that and guide you back. And if you haven't ever had that experience, I'll simply say this. This might sound strange to you. It's not. It's not. He created you. Some people say, well, I can't believe in something that I haven't seen. Yeah, do you believe in love? Well, I've seen love. No, you haven't. You've seen the results of the expressions of love. Do you believe in the wind? Well, I've seen wind. No, you haven't. You've seen the results of wind. You've seen a flag waving, wheat waving, something like that. You haven't seen the wind. You've seen the results and the effects of wind. If you pay attention, you will see the results and the effects of God and God's love all around you. Reach out to him. Ask him. Say, Lord, I don't know you. I'm not sure about you, but I'm opening myself up. Come into me. Change me. Save me. So that's my story. Am I? Thanks for the question. 
Uh, it was uncomfortable for me to uh, decide to do this, but, uh, <laughs> well, God sometimes directs us in ways that are uncomfortable for us, and I hope that this has helped somebody out there. God bless you all, and I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.